time for our final discussion for today, which will explore how technology is drastically impacting the trajectory of global geopolitics and national security. Great powers are competing with one another to secure or maintain technological advantage. To unpack this in further detail, we'll first hear a short opening address from Dr. Michael Horowitz, the Director of the Emerging Capabilities Policy Office in the Office of the Under Secretary of Defence for Policy in the United States. This will be followed by a panel discussion led by Samir Saran, President, Observer Research Foundation. And our additional panelists for this session are Kestudis Boudris, National Security Advisor to the President of the Republic of Lithuania, David Koh, the Commissioner of Cybersecurity and the Chief Executive of the Cyber Security Agency of Singapore, and Professor Tanya Munro, Australia's Chief Defence Scientist. Please welcome them to the stage. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today at the Sydney Dialogue, even if through this recorded virtual setting. It's always a pleasure to engage on topics like the intersection of technological change, geopolitics, and national security. My name is Michael Horowitz, and in the Department of Defense, I serve as the Director of the Emerging Capabilities Policy Office under the Under Secretary of Defense for Policy. Our portfolio covers a number of emerging capability issues, and we are also the OSD policy lead for both pillars of AUKUS. In these introductory remarks, I will lay out how the U.S. Department of Defense is thinking about the intersection of technological change and geopolitical competition and what it means for the security environment, particularly in the context of the Indo-Pacific, a vital region for the future of the world. I wanna tell you about three trends shaping this intersection of technological change, geopolitics, and national security. First, a series of technologies, including artificial intelligence, biotechnology, and cyber are already online and growing more sophisticated every day in ways that are already reshaping economies, societies, and militaries. For example, the recent public release of large language models like ChatGPT illustrates the way advances in AI and machine learning can revolutionize how we aggregate, access, and process information everywhere from the classroom to the military. These advances represent general purpose technologies like the combustion engine and the aircraft in prior generations. They have strategic consequences and the drivers and impacts are so much broader. They reflect a trend where so many of the cutting edge technologies of today have experienced booms due to private sector and commercial investment. Second, these technological changes are accelerating changes in the security environment. The 2022 U.S. National Defense Strategy clearly describes this evolving strategic environment in the way the People's Republic of China is seeking to leverage technological advantage to create systemic challenges. Furthermore, Russia's horrific invasion of Ukraine, triggering, triggering the largest war in Europe since World War II, makes Russia an acute threat that we also think about every day in this context. Third, we cannot go it alone if we are going to succeed in this complex world. As Under Secretary of Defense Call said last fall, this is not a competition of countries, it's a competition of coalitions. Close collaboration with allies and partners is not just foundational for U.S. national security interests, it's necessary to strengthen and sustain deterrence in light of rapidly emerging technologies. The unbreakable alliance that the United States shares with Australia, for example, is a manifestation of our work and commitment to reduce institutional barriers, including those that inhibit collective research and development, planning, interoperability, information sharing, and technology sharing. The AUKUS partnership between Australia, the United Kingdom, and the United States is an illustration of this commitment. AUKUS is a generational opportunity that, as Secretary of Defense Austin says, will strengthen our combined military capabilities, boost our defense industrial capacity, enhance our ability to deter aggression, and promote our shared goal of a free and open Indo-Pacific. AUKUS is a shared long-term investment that will allow us to build defense advantages that endure for decades to come. Successfully competing is about creating stability and making conflict less likely, helping ensure that free and open Indo-Pacific where all nations can prosper free from coercion. But this is not just about competition, it's also about cooperation. 
We need a common understanding of how we develop and use the military tools of today and tomorrow in line with our values. For example, the United States recently introduced a political declaration on responsible military use of artificial intelligence and autonomy. This non-binding international agreement establishes strong norms of responsible behavior for military actions surrounding AI and autonomy, building on lessons learned from over a decade of Defense Department policies. It's part of our commitment to responsible speed, ensuring that the global adoption of military AI and autonomy happens in a way that minimizes unintended bias and accidents while maximizing the benefits. As you engage on these topics and more today, consider the individual, state, and global impacts of emerging technologies. Are there latent fears or mistrust of certain technologies? How will certain technological advances impact security dynamics? How can we amplify opportunities to work together to address global challenges? Thank you so much for your time today. And while it's unfortunate I can't be there in person, I hope that this video can contribute to a lively discussion with an excellent panel. Good luck with the rest of the critical conversations happening as part of the Sydney Dialogue, and thank you. Good afternoon. We've had two um, very um, compelling keynotes this afternoon. One, of course, on waking us up from the cyber slumber and going to the gym. Uh, I think that's true largely of technology and and our approach to technology, which has um, generally seen it as a essential addition to the arsenal of governments, uh, to, the, uh, to the, uh, the nuances and economies, um, to the implications on individual lives. They've been seen as, as a net positive. And in some ways, um, we've had a, a necessarily a, a, a euphoric approach to integrating technologies into all aspects of our existence. Um, the last few years tells us that we perhaps need to moderate some of the assessments and perhaps study some of our uh, relationships with uh, many of these uh, innovations that are beginning to shape our lives, our politics, our futures, uh, our partnerships, and indeed uh, the global order. So this discussion today hopes to engage on some of those big questions that different regions and, and specific uh, ministries and, and departments around the world uh, are, uh, are in a way reflecting on and uh, are thinking about deeply, are also having to, in many cases, being forced to respond to uh, due to the speed of innovation that sometimes itself is a big disruptor. Uh, and uh, uh, I would certainly hope that at the end of the day we will be able to uh, think about three big questions. Uh, the first, uh, how is it really going to change the way nations assess national security? And what are the implications for the institutional capabilities nations must invest into to be able to do this? Second, since innovation takes place equally and perhaps more so in the private sector, are companies beginning to realize the importance of what they do and the consequences of some of their own products and some of their own offerings in the markets, the collateral damages, and of course the benefits that accrue through it, and how are corporations aligning to national security imperatives? Uh, how are transnational platforms uh, beginning to uh, wear their color or wear the coalition uh, in their codes, and uh, indeed, uh, are they cognizant of the deeper consequences of their work besides the bottom lines that they continue to serve? And the third and final question, of course, is uh, how is it, how is technology and geopolitics uh, creating sometimes uh, uh, uneasy, but uh, in many, many uh, instances, a cozy relationship with state actions? Uh, you know, someone mentioned that state act, state sanctioned cyber attacks. Uh, I would argue that many states have actually weaponized the entire digital and technology sphere, and uh, uh, it's not only uh, one uh, uh, a particular country that I would refer to, but I would argue that, that from the time uh, of the Cold War and uh, even, in even preceding that to the moment today, we have seen uh, countries in, in, in North America, in, in Europe, and now, of course, uh, China, uh, who see uh, um, a certain strategic uh, benefit 
to the state control or the state influence over both the direction of technology as well as uh, uh, the kind of uh, ends they can help uh, meet uh, for, uh, for countries. And, and we're going to do this with three fantastic speakers. Uh, they've already been introduced, but let me start with uh, uh, the NSA from Lithuania. Uh, you're in the hot seat for more reasons than one. Uh, but, but let me ask you, uh, how has, in your assessment, technology implicated geopolitics, the one that is playing out in your region, in, in Europe, the war in Europe. And because of the geopolitics of the region, um, what are the big technology questions that you guys are dealing with? You know, I, I've just, I, I was in Europe last week, and I can tell you, I was telling a colleague of mine from India that Europe is the new champion of non-alignment. Uh, 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 every conversation I have there is about how do we not choose between US and China? And U.S. is determined to make you choose between U.S. and China. The chip wars, the, the min critical mineral supply chains, uh, the clear um, the emphasis on, on being on the right side of history is, is going to have to force you to make choices. How is Europe going to avoid this? Have there been changes courtesy the war in Ukraine? Your views, Kastutis. Yeah. Thank you. And first of all, let me, yeah. Thank you, SP, for inviting and, and being part of this wonderful panel and, and uh, being able to answer these, uh, these questions. Actually, if you, Samir, would uh, visit Lithuania, you wouldn't be you know, surprised with the answer because it's very clear and it's not about choosing one of the, uh, one of the sides and because we do not see it as you know, which side to choose uh, to get the answer. Because uh, as the small country uh, being next to big, aggressive country being next to Russia with aggressive behavior that it was uh, you know, that we could see for many years against uh, its neighbors and then the, we managed to to live with it and uh, not uh, uh, not to be not to be victimized in each each uh, case and they managed to develop some tools to counter different type of uh, interference of uh, hybrid uh, uh, activities against us. And if you, you name it, it's from economy, energy transport, uh, it is informational sphere, and it's cyber for sure, uh, and, and all the others that we've seen uh, during the 30 years uh, of our regained independence. So when there is new challenge, the first thing what we do is we look through what we can do in ourselves, where we, where we are vulnerable, where we can increase our security, where we can, uh, where we can copy something and then develop in, in, in our case. So what concerns uh, technology, of course, for us in the recent years before the war in Ukraine started, and uh, I would like to later on to talk about it also, so it was the cyber-enabled activities. Mm -hmm. And it's not, no, not only intelligence collection uh, for the uh, state purposes coming from Russia in different ways, but also cyber-enabled informational operations and, uh, and other activities and, uh, and even political interference with the cyber element uh, in it. And that was uh, one of the reasons why we were pushing hard uh, on the cyber security. And, and, uh, and build the institutional framework, cooperation with the industries, many things that the minister described here and went to the gym, you know, many times and, and uh, yeah, we're building up uh, the muscles and uh, we are what concerns regulation and, and the very model, uh, one of the top five still countries uh, in the world because we had the very good reason for it because we had the threat here next to our door and uh, we were in a case some playground for, for some Russia's activities. So, looking in, into the future and, and uh, looking into the EU uh, agenda, uh, it, it's not about the choice and it's, it's about the best practices that can be uh, implemented and applied and we had a lot of the, and still have a lot of practice to show and to share how we did it and where it could otherwise lead. And uh, you know, what concerns different topics about the uh, decoupling in different spheres and, and what could be the cost of it and what could be the advantages of it, we did it already. So we can, we can show the, you know, the, the cost list and, and, the, and what you can gain in doing it, also in a technological sphere. So we are, Trying no, to, let, let, to, let, me to ask you, yeah. let me ask you a question there. Is it going to be as easy for Lithuania and the EU to decouple from China as it was from Russia? And it was not easy, don't get me wrong. I'm saying it was, you, you took costs to do it, right? From energy decoupling to transportation decoupling to infrastructure decoupling. 
Is it the same as making a choice, uh, uh, having to make that choice vis-a-vis -vis China? Or Russia, because it was such a smaller economic actor, it had, uh, it had a very small footprint compared to a $17 trillion GDP or a $18 trillion GDP of China, that uh, you might have folks in EU who don't agree with the Lithuanian assessment. Of course, and it's very natural. I guess we are family you know, of nations, and, and we built on consensus our decisions. Of course, it is difficult from the beginning, but we are discussing. That's, that's, the, that's the process, and, and uh, we have the strong arguments in it. And one of the arguments that we were not listened to, and now the, the, we are acknowledged to be right, because we hear a lot in the Baltics and in Lithuania that, yeah, you were right about some certain things related to Russia. So one of the things was that we were right is that interdependence creates somehow the background for cooperation and for peace in the future. We were saying that, no, it's not creating. It's creating delusion that you might, <laughs> that you might be safer in this way. And then with Russia, that was the case. On, uh, on, our, on our soil in Lithuania, we were experiencing the use of energy, for example, as being the tool for the political reason. We were cut off the gas supply for the political reason. For the bigger Europe, it happened when the war in Ukraine started. And there was the choice just to reorient all the import to, mm -hmm. to, to other mm -hmm. sources. Same with, the, same with the other decisions. And uh, actually, that is the surprising paradox uh, what concerns Russia's and China's threat to Europe and when the reaction is faster, when it's slower. I remember when we in Lithuania introduced the uh, in, in screening of the investment, mm -hmm. then we in, introduced the screening of okay. the contracts, then the screening of technologies. We, we are screening everything that is coming from abroad and especially from the East. So when we introduced that and said that, look, it's a good, good practice, it doesn't contradict the three movement of capital. We should we should do it because what comes with Russia's capital, you know, all the nasty things, you know, up to up to up to the very basement of your security. And you know, there was this slow reaction to it. But when the, it was realized that the China's capital investment into the strategic sectors can lead into losing some, some of your technologies, losing some, some property of yours and making you more vulnerable, that pushed the political process faster than it was with, with Russia. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and, and, and for example, same was with the propaganda, encountering propaganda. And yeah, in fact, your government yeah. was accused of restricting freedom of speech. Yes. And By I, your neighbors yeah, in, yeah, in, yeah. In, in, in the Scandinavian countries. Yes, that it was, we were criticized uh, after the first war against Ukraine, or first stage started in 2014. Uh, we had this huge wave of propaganda coming from, uh, from Russia in different, uh, you know, different ways. And of course, the television, that was their, the main tool. They invested mm -hmm. hundreds of millions into that to make the influence on, on us. And we started to limit it, saying that, look, it's not the freedom of speech and it's not the different opinion as they were presenting. Mm -hmm. This is the war propaganda. This is disinformation. This is mm -hmm. the hatred uh, against the, the neighboring nations. And that was the reason why we were And now everyone down. has embraced it in the yes. EU. And now it's then after some time it was the good practice to be implemented because when apply, you are applying it, it's you have to go with also the all the legal framework, you know, how to do it, and with all the institutional framework. This is a know-how how to do it in democracy. We are not autocracies that are shutting down, you know, television. So uh, I'll yeah, leave you with a question, I'll come back to you a bit later and I'll move to Tanya now. My question to you would be that uh, since in the green room we were talking about asymmetries and reciprocity, um, how Fair is it that uh, 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 Chinese handles uh, are at play on our public sphere? They engage in our politics, they comment on our foreign policies, they engage in our domestic policies. And while uh, it would be difficult for anyone to be critical on the Chinese public spheres, and, and is there a time to rethink whether we should have a degree of reciprocity and symmetry on the access to each other's public sphere? I'm leaving that with you. That should there be now a, a, a consensus amongst liberal countries that if you want to engage with our public sphere, we need to have an embassy in yours as well. If you throw out my ambassador, I kick out yours as well. So I think, do we in the digital age need to have a different format of, of engagement? Tanya, uh, I, I think uh, Minister O'Neill's uh, address was all about you. It's all about going to the gym, building the muscle, the chief <laughs> defense scientist. It already um, uh, conjures up image of, of this whole you know, slick, smart group of people um, scripting the security future. It also, in some ways, under, uh, undergirds what I would argue is the world's first um, security alliance in the digital age, AUKUS. Uh, you know, that's clearly the first, and, and even if you don't go too far, you were the first one there. 
Um, uh, so, uh, they, they, I mean, I'm not saying that you will not go far. Uh, I'm saying you have to go very far to go we far. We like a challenge. Many so. years, right? <laughs> So, uh, but, but you know, the fact is it's all happening out of here. This, uh, you know, you had a cyber ambassador before most countries did in Australia. You are now thinking about the joint, a jo a whole of government approach to uh, the threat. You are clearly looking at expertise as one of the ingredients for building up those cyber muscles or digital muscles, if I could extend that same argument to a bigger sphere. Uh, my question to you would be that, uh, what does the life of a chief defense scientist look like today when, when technology and ge geopolitics is inseparable. And do you think Chad GPT could write the next defense white paper or do you still have to do it yourself? <laughs> so many questions in one. If I start from Minister O'Neill, what you could all feel viscerally through her presentation is the urgency our government feels to drive change that really gives Australia that more resilient, more robust place in the world. That's an urgency that is filtered right across our government, across all of our ministers with responsibilities for national security and defence. And when I think about that and what that means for us, the challenges and the opportunities ahead, for me it comes down to a much greater sharpness than I think we've ever had before around the priorities that we really need to knuckle in on as a nation and harness expertise. It puts a sharpness of focus like I have never observed before on our alliances and how those alliances work. And it puts a real urgency into changing the way we think about bringing new technology into service. Mm -hmm. And I think all of those things come together in a really powerful way. And all of those affect what it's like to be <laughs> chief defence scientist. So we've been on a journey um, to articulate to our nation the priorities that we need our brightest minds to be focused on. We started this journey three years ago with articulating eight star shots, which are big, hairy challenges that need new knowledge, new innovation, partnerships, public, private sector, alliances, and that has taken us a reasonable way in terms of aligning our academic capacity and sparking creativity and agility from our industry. And I can talk to some examples there. What we're seeing now is an appetite for taking that new way of thinking in beyond the science and the technology, beyond the proof of concept, but right through to the way we acquire mm -hmm. capability meaning a profound shift from a world in which in our militaries we required a really specific articulation of specifications, which is impossible, I put it to you, in a world where technology is changing so mm -hmm. fast mm -hmm. that what we actually need to be doing is getting technology into the hands of warfighters as soon as it reaches some minimum viable state because much of the innovation about how we'll use it comes from it being in the hands of those who know mm -hmm. the challenges they face. So that's the paradigm shift we're living through at the moment. I find myself increasingly thinking in this new world about asymmetry, mm -hmm. because as a small nation, we can no longer afford to think about capability gaps. They're everywhere. Mm -hmm. But we have some huge areas of national advantage in things like information sciences, which obviously mm -hmm. plays in very tightly to the topics we've talked about in cyber, in quantum sciences, in many areas where we have leading edge but don't necessarily have the scale of industry capacity. And this is where, I guess, to round out the answer to your comment, or your question, Samir, um, alliances and a new way of working in alliances. While we have a deep, long tradition from Australia of working deeply with the United States, our Five Eyes, Singapore, Japan, Republic of Korea, many different ways in which we work together. And it's often easier for scientists to find that common language and way of working together. What is profoundly shifting is the recognition that we all share that common sense of urgency mm -hmm. that shortens the timelines, that means that we need to be able to enhance the reliance on those allies to bring forward into that partnership things they're uniquely good at. 
And I think that's incredibly powerful. And I'd say that one of the best counters we have to autocratic states and different ways of developing technology potential adversaries have is the degree of strategic uncertainty that comes from what you can really do in an mm -hmm. alliance. Mm -hmm. To c continue the sporting analogy, I think this is more now a relay mm -hmm. where our allied nations all have a distinct role to play that allows us to move faster together. A and as to whether chat GPT would ever write <laughs> a white paper, you'll see come out at the end of this month, our government is committed to coming out with a public version of the Defence Strategic Review. You will see that dripping with the urgency that I describe, and it'll, you'll see it coming with some areas of great clarity mm -hmm. and change for Australia. I think it will test us. It will test our ability to mobilise our intellectual capital of the nation. But I'm, I'm cautiously confident because we've already seen a very strong response to the challenges we've put out there now. Mm -hmm. And I think that as long as we get better and better at bringing our industry in and understanding that threat landscape, and I think that's something that we can learn from other nations, we can make really big strides. You know, let me... Um to ask you um, a question that has always um, bothered me ever since I read a report that came out of the UK. And that report had emphasized on how uh, many of the research um, ecosystems, uh, for example, the uh, one in some of the top colleges in, in the United Kingdom, had been compromised by funding and sponsorships by certain actors, most notably China, where literally uh, the bulk of every output was literally serving the agenda of the Communist Party. Now, uh, you can rely on your expertise and your, your intellectual heft and, and, of course, the partnerships and the global educational networks that Australia is clearly a leader in. Uh, how compromised are they? Are you worried about it? Uh, have you been studying this? And is there some corrective action that we all need to be thinking about? Yes, this is a very significant issue. And this is something Australia, I would argue, is somewhat ahead of the curve on. We have worked very collegially. In fact, I think it's a, a model for how we can bring together different sectors to develop a set of guidelines and best practice for countering foreign interference in our universities. It's quite a challenge because we don't have the domestic scale of um, research students and the like that our research enterprise needs to keep it fed. And there's a lot of vulnerabilities to that form of influence when you have a research system that is quite resource poor. Mm -hmm. But that said, as I put it to you a moment ago, I think we have a really good best practice guide to how we can lift all boats in countering foreign interference. So I recommend the UFIT guidelines to you all. It's something that is never set and forget, but is always very actively interrogated and ranges on everything from how we provide that safety and security for our people on our campuses right through to cyber security, right through to declaring where our researchers secure their funds from, helping them understand mm -hmm. what the implications of sourcing funds in um, unconventional ways can mean. One thing I would also say is from a perspective of the Department of Defence, we now have, across all of Australia's universities and research organisations, very clear guidelines for really the minimum conditions for those organisations to engage in defence-related research. That requires all these organisations to secure DISP accreditation, Defence Industry Security Program accreditation, to have staff that become security cleared and to meet certain hygiene requirements, which I think is just lifting all boats in terms of awareness of the issue. And my final question to you before I turn to David, who's been nodding his head on a... And now he's also grimaced once when, when you <laughs> mentioned interoperability is dead, right? So I saw David uh, uh, respond to that as well. But I'll come to you, David. Just last question to you, Danya. Um, how does the private sector respond to this? You know, I, I remember I was uh, at a panel with one of my favourite Europeans, uh, Maritia Shake. She used to be an MEP and she used to work on the digital sector and someone asked her that, do politicians get technology? And she asked uh, the, 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 the poser of the question that, do technologists understand politics? <laughs> so my question to you is, does the private sector get this geopolitical moment? 
or are they still literally living on their own innovation, innovation island? So how do you get the private sector aligned to your work as a scientist here? I think it's a varied response. I think we are seeing a real savvy amongst some parts of our industry, some of which has never historically worked in defence, but can feel the urgency and can see the opportunity. I think some of our more traditional parts of defence industry are really re-imagining um, ways of working. It's not that they don't understand the strategic context, but that we need to help them change the systems mm -hmm. um, of working because in Australia, because we don't have the prime landscape that other places have, we have to take a different approach mm -hmm. with how we nurture and assemble ecosystems of small to medium enterprises and can't sit back and ever assume that can, that can all be done through our primes. And I think that's incredibly powerful and important because without that custodianship, in some way we lose that sovereign agency as a nation to see how we can connect that intellectual capital to the problem space. David, um, you heard the two interventions at the very beginning. I could think of a number of questions from there to you. Uh, S uh, Singapore as a hub, and therefore the importance of data security, the role of state and non-state actors, and is Singapore thinking about that? That was one thing that came to my mind immediately. But uh, I also uh, think uh, uh, I would like your response to um, Kastuta's point, the point made by the NSA on, on uh, uh, interoperability, mm -hmm. uh, its usefulness, uh, decoupling, and our preparedness. Great. And if you're sitting in Singapore where you are a confluence of interests and therefore you've always been the hub, how does a, a country like yours or a, or, a, or a polity like yours think about these very real uh, emergencies, right? Uh, both decoupling as well as um, the, the, the whole idea of having segregated um, technology spheres. Thanks very much, Samir. First of all, thanks very much to SP for inviting me here. This is a great uh, opportunity for dialogue. Before I actually respond, I just wanted to respond to Tanya. Because sitting here next to you, listening to you say that Australia is a small country and you lack resources. <laughs> <laughs> I think both Kastudis and myself uh, it's might... Luckily, uh, yeah, luckily it's, all all it's all relative. It's all relative. From our perspective, last time I checked, you're a lot larger than we are. You have a lot more resources than we have. Okay, let me make everyone at ease. Uh, Samia, if you, all... if you start saying that India is a small country... <laughs> I... No. I was saying that between the four of us, we are 1.4 billion people. Don't worry about size. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, but I, I think, uh, jokes aside, it, it, it is a uh, um, very relevant point, because I, I think it's all relative. And in this uh, environment that we're working in, and the topics that we're dealing with, technology, it is writ large. And I think no one country, regardless of how large, can fully come to grips with the issues by themselves. I think that's a key point. Uh, so perhaps you, you might have thought that uh, in, in the traditional areas, uh, there were possibilities to, to mm. um, corner the market, uh, set standards, etc. I think that the reality is that in this new domain where technology is evolving at such a quick uh, pace, Horowitz uh, made the point that um, AI, for example, is like the industrial com uh, combustion, combustion engine, uh, computers, etc. I don't disagree, but I want to make the point that the pace of change, the impact of change will be that it's the same scale, but the pace of change is significantly much faster. Uh, on the um, uh, minister's uh, comment about hitting the gym, etc., I, I think that from Singapore's vantage point, uh, take the point completely. Uh, I have um, the uh, dubious honour of being the cyber coordinator from Singapore's perspective. So I see um, the breadth of challenge. I totally resonate with um, the minister's uh, sense of urgency and with the need for us to have someone to have a broader perspective um, across interdepartmental um, lines, for example. Or as I, someone else told me, uh, that for the Prime Minister to make it, to be very clear on who is responsible the next time there is a breach. So that's my perspective on some of these uh, uh, challenges that we face. On uh, how we can go about dealing with this, I'd like to say uh, two things. First of all, I think there are um, some conversations about whether we need to uh, be more focused on security, 
versus interoperability. I'd like to uh, make the point that I don't think, I think this is a false choice. I think that the, it's not a simple issue of you either have one or the other. First of all, not all systems are, need interoperability. Not all systems are designed for interoperability. National security systems are not designed for interoperability. Mm -hmm. My information is encrypted. My encryptors are not meant to interoperate with yours. And, and you know, mm -hmm. that's a clear-cut uh, issue. On the other hand, uh, there are systems for banking, international trade and finance, uh, civil aviation. These do not have such a strong national security component. They are meant for interoperability mm -hmm. for, for economic reasons, trade reasons, safety reasons. Um, so we should separate the two. There are concerns about resilience. There are concerns about um, supply chains. The pandemic has shown us the concerns about resilience and, and supply chains. So over and above technology challenges, the pandemic, uh, supply chain uh, disruptions, etc., show us the need for have, to have um, um, resilience. Now, but when we talk about security and resilience, these tend to be about supply chains. Who builds this? Uh, where are the components about this? These are two separate issues. Yes, I'm concerned about supply chains, but it doesn't mean that the technology standards that we use need to be different. We can have the same tech stack, we can achieve interoperability even if we build stuff differently. Uh, for example, if you have concerns about Huawei cell phones, then don't buy Huawei cell phones. But say, Huawei cell phones still work in my country, still work in your country. We're old enough to remember when we went to Japan, cell phones didn't work because the technology was different, different standards. We don't want to go back to that world. I think the world has achieved an enormous amount of convergence because of common standards, because of interoperability. Um, access to information, access to education, um, uh, opportunities for uh, uplift of uh, the economy, op economic opportunities. All this has been made possible by digitalization because of common standards. Uh, if we start moving into a direction where you have different standards, you lose that interoperability, and I argue that it will affect the way we live, work and play. Our ability to educate the, our populations, our ability to give them the economic opportunities to grasp the myriad opportunities that digitalization uh, affords all of us will be affected. Uh, David, let me uh, just take you up on that particular point on uh, standards. Now, we are seeing the weaponization of international institutions which have been tasked with the, for writing those standards. We've seen the ITU, for example, right? So uh, it's, it's one thing to say that we want common standards, but it is also another to understand that someone is writing those standards for political and economic benefits. So how do you and how do we, as, as, as partner countries or as folks who are interested in preserving the integrity of the digital space, work together? So you're absolutely right. There have been accusations that some countries have started to uh, undermine the standards uh, uh, creation bodies. And we see um, operations where um, the, the people who represent um, the standards uh, um, uh, um, writers are actually um, funded mm -hmm. by individual states, etc. This is not the direction that we should be moving in. Um, standards should be underwritten by objective, technical, um, interoperable and uh, um, standards which are underpinned by the value that it brings in terms uh, from a scientific perspective. Right? Can it achieve um, the technical goals better? Is it more effective? Is it more efficient? Is it more secure? These are not uh, uh, things which are coloured or affected by what sort of government uh, it comes from, objectively speaking, or uh, what is the um, uh, type of uh, government that uh, it operates under. But these are objective, technical standards which can be uh, viewed. The, so I think it's a com incumbent for us, firstly, to agree that this is the direction that we want to move. And then second, agree that um, the, the way that we safeguard this is that the individuals who are party to the standard setting bodies are indeed technical stand, um, uh, experts. And they are not uh, affected uh, by the source of funding, for example. That, that should so, be the direction so David, that we take. When you do trend analysis or looking ahead, some of the disruptions that could be headed our way, do you sometimes fear that we could we, uh, fear that we could be ending up in a world which has uh, two or three or four distinct 
ecosystems that emerge, competing ecosystems, are, you know, defined by different sets of standards. Do you think that's a possibility as you look ahead into the future? Uh, well, my upbringing is that I'm firstly an optimist. Uh, I hope for the best, but my upbringing is that we. You know, I, I don't trust worst. cyber people talking about optimism. We heard the minister; it was a great <laughs> speech, and she says, "It's I'm I, I'm optimistic about the future." I heard nothing in her speech that gave me any optimism. <laughs> I'm inspired by Minister O'Neill, all you right? You just have to look at the, our power um, plugs in devices across the world right. to see that, you know, we can tolerate uh, multiple standards. Multiple, One thing uh, I would say is that the huge advantage um, that comes from being able to move fast in setting standards should not be underestimated. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we need to focus when we talk about um, the approach that like-minded nations take to technology development. Because my view is if we move fast and try to not, in some ways, overthink mm -hmm. the ultimate end state of a technology, mm -hmm but get it into use earlier, that precipitates the development of the standards and the understanding of the concepts of operation. And I think that's what we need to do. So, uh, you know, let me uh, very quickly ask both of you, uh, uh, Tanya as well as David, since you are in this part of the woods, um, the, the Indian Ocean region and the Indo-Pacific, um, the Ukraine war also, in many ways, brought to the fore the deep political divisions in the region. You know, did you sanction uh, Moscow or did you not sanction them? Were you part of a, uh, you know, rather loud, loud uh, uh, group that was determined to, uh, to, to paint a certain picture? Or were you trying to be the more balanced and neutral party to it? You know, there were these very clear divisions that have been brought on. ASEAN, most notably, uh, Singapore, the odd one out. Um, how, uh, I mean, not the odd one out, the odd one out in ASEAN. Uh, you're not the odd one out, but within your within that particular group. And here I want to bring in the geo the geo, the geopolitics and how it will change or shape your agency in pursuing your own tech agenda. So if you have to take along a group because you did mention the digital trade and digital finance, digital payments, they're all important aspects, right? If they disagree with you on certain positions of principles that you may ch uh, elect to 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 defend in the future. Uh, how will it work for uh, a country like Singapore? You are tied to your region, right? Uh, so, if I may... And, 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 and Tanya, to a lesser extent, even with you, you know, you have the islands uh, to, to the east, you have uh, ASEAN to your north, and you are increasingly being embraced by um, uh, India. Now, how do you manage these three, four different, you know, besides your traditional um, American... Uh, 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 relationship or the uh, or the relationship with UK and uh, and the continent, right? So for, uh, over to you, David. How do you balance the geopolitics of the region with geopolitics of technology? Right. Uh, thanks very much. Well, first of all, Singapore um, uh, denounced the Russian invasion of Ukraine um, as uh, and imposed sanctions unilateral. It's actually only the second time in Singapore's history that we have imposed sanctions without the UN Security Council uh, mandate. Um, interestingly enough, why did we do this? So the point I want to make is that we didn't do it because we chose sides. It's not that we support Ukraine over Russia, but on a matter of principle. It is a gross violation of international law, the UN Charter. It's a violation of the integrity, territorial integrity of a sovereign state. And of course, it upends the international rules-based order. For a small country like Singapore, we are dependent on the international rules-based order and the sovereignty of uh, nation states. On that principle, we objected, uh, we denounced the invasion um, of Ukraine by Russia. For the record, in 1983, we similarly objected to the invasion of Grenada by the United States. So we stand uh, on a matter of principle, regardless of who uh, does the invading. All right. Now, why do we... Uh, believe this, why do we stand on this matter of principle? Because as a small state, we think that it depends on the international rules-based system. Mm -hmm. What is the international rules-based system? Well, if you look at it, I, I think it's worth unpacking this a little bit. Um, Post-World War II, um, the victors uh, behaved in a manner which was unusual. They reconstructed Japan and Germany, the losing countries, and invested heavily in their reconstruction. In Southeast Asia, we have benefited very much from the, the security umbrella provided by the US presence in our region. Singapore, for example, I think our GDP has grown by 100 times 
since post-World War II to today. Um, so we are firm beneficiaries of the rules-based order that has allowed us to benefit as a trading hub and then now as a digital hub uh, in our region. So why are we able to do this? Because we've been able to have interoperable systems uh, in terms of trade, eco economic uh, stability, No, et David, I, I get that. My point is your neighbors don't have that right. same assessment. Yes. Now, how do you manage that relationship? I give you full marks for principles. Now tell me, <laughs> what do you do with the politics of the region? Right. right. So we, I think that uh, the reality is that uh, as what... Uh, uh, my Lithuanian uh, um, counterpart has said, it's a family of nations. <laughs> so there are different families, even in the EU, which would, one would argue is uh, perhaps uh, not as, uh, as uh, heterogeneous as uh, ASEAN. I think in ASEAN, we have a multitude of countries. Uh, some are monarchies, uh, some are operating on a different uh, history system, culture. Um, it is a challenge to deal with this. Some of them are more um, uh, focused on their uh, domestic issues mm -hmm. than they are on the international geopolitics. All of us have benefited and stand to benefit from the benefits that digitalization can bring to our countries. Some of them, uh, it's an opportunity to uplift their populations, uh, grow economically, etc. Uh, one would argue that they should operate this way, but those are the challenges. How do we defend the Pacific? Tanya. Look, you know, you've given really powerful statements there, David. I. I probably don't need to iterate to this audience how pivotal it is to Australia to, to maintain and play a role in the security and, and um, peace in the Pacific. That predominantly doesn't get considered through a technological lens from an Australian mm -hmm. viewpoint. And I think that's something that's interesting to reflect on. <laughs> What I would say, the biggest impact, to go back to the core of your question, Samir, the biggest impact of changing geopolitics on technology is urgency and prioritisation. Mm -hmm. And that, to me, doesn't show primarily as that choice of how do we go about, as a nation, developing our own strengths and leaning into those priorities. As, as a distinct choice from how our neighbours do that, it shows much more about much more active alliances. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those alliances, um, I think, have served us well mm -hmm. in times of peace and in times of war. But I think now, in times of technology, it's a, it's a new... It's a new ballgame. It's a new ballgame. Can I add, can I add to... And Kasuna, uh, I'm going to come to you now with uh, my original question, but also on this issue. Right. Could I just add to what Tanya has said? I think there's another dimension that's different. I think in the traditional kinetic space, um, countries own the fighter jets, the submarines and the tanks. Uh, but in the digital space, big tech uh, operates and they are a significant player in the geopolitics. Great. So it's not just countries. We have to consider... The non-state actor is a far more important yes. uh, f uh, force in this particular segment. Kastutis, uh, I asked you a question at the beginning, reciprocity and, and a whole new diplomatic architecture for the digital future, technology future. But also let me ask you uh, an extension of the same question. Huawei phones was what David mentioned, use of Huawei phones. Let's talk about Huawei and your networks in Europe. We have seen EU fail to agree on what to do with Huawei. And this is not a recent debate. This is the debate now which is at least five years old. So uh, when we see the, the incapability of a union to, to agree on an approach to a question that is, is of, uh, of importance to some, as they have clearly expressed, uh, what is the future of a union in responding to the ever-evolving and very dynamic technology landscape? Uh, by the way, uh, I'm now going to also take questions. So if you, can, if you want to walk to the mics, they are here in the aisle and I will uh, uh, call you in as I spot you. Uh, there are two mics that I can see, one on, one on my left and one on my right, and you could, uh, you could join me there. But Kasul, over to you. Yeah, uh, answering the, this question, there was not an issue in Lithuania about the Huawei uh, as the company. That was the, the question of the, our vulnerabilities to the technologies that can be exploited, and we have the precedence that they were exploited in the way to take the political and other advantage. So in this way, there was a decision, and, and that was not a EU decision, that was a national decision. We passed the law saying that all the technologies related to 
5G uh, development it has to be from the certain countries and uh, we have the, all the screening mechanism to it. Why it was done in, in, in this way? Because there are some risks that you cannot mitigate yourself. And it's uh, one of the risk management and risk mitigation tools is you know, th just to decouple from the, from the process. And maybe it's not the very correct word, word but it's to minimize the dependency that can be exploited. Just to remind you that when the conflict started, when the war against Ukraine started, they, from Russia's side, they exploited all the connections and all the vulnerabilities from cyber to informational to corrupt, corruptive uh, networks to, to political interference, everything that, that was in their hands. So thinking from this point of view and being from my region, when you understand that it's not theoretically that will Correct. be exploited, I have this criteria, was it ever, you know, somewhere, have, you know, in, in the nature scene, you know, so when we've seen something, we, we checking how it would work, as, we, as it was with our relations with China. We also checked before our uh, strong political decisions on co economic cooperation uh, with Taiwan, what could be the consequences based on the experience of all the, all the countries that uh, were in one way or another with, with the disagreement with China. And we had this one, and on addition, something that was never seen uh, elsewhere. So those were indirect uh, e economic uh, measures that were applied mm -hmm. to us. And on reciprocity, I just want to say that we will be, we, democratic nations with our values. That's why it's not the, just a choice between the apples and oranges. That's the absolutely different uh, thinking. So with our values, we will never be in a position, for example, to apply some tools of propaganda or some, some mm -hmm. uh, surveillance mm -hmm. mechanism mm -hmm. or exploiting cyber criminals, for example, as Minister mentioned, you know, yes. the using of cyber criminals against mm -hmm. Ukraine. We know that uh, the Russia services were using cyber criminals against the opposition. And there are even, you know, all the infrastructure for that. So we're just, you know, they were taking this experience and applying it into the different field. So we have those differences, fundamental differences, that we will be never able to agree on some common ground of regulation, for example, some ethics on AI or in, in, in mm -hmm. any other different field. So when we do not have this, and when, when we see the speed of the development that is on, you know, other sides. So for us, it is other side. It's not just, you know, our neighborhood. So there is this urge of, you know, pushing forward and being faster, inevitable. And then mm -hmm. that's what we have to do. And there is additional factor that uh, Russia is at war. And when you are at war, there is, you know, this mm -hmm. application of different and then learning and, and testing different techniques much, much faster than, than we are doing. Mm. So we have uh, three, I can see, who want to pose questions. Please introduce yourself briefly, and uh, you can direct your question to a panelist or to the panel. Uh, and we will take all three of them, and we'll come back to you uh, as we begin to wrap up this particular session. Over to you, sir. Sure. Uh, Akira Igata from the University of Tokyo. I've also recently joined ASPI as a visiting senior fellow. Um, since this session is about technology, geopolitics, and national security, I want to ask you about what your opinions are on outbound investment screening. Um, of course, every country has increased their internal uh, screening mechanism for investment to make sure that uh, IP and emerging and advanced technologies aren't leaked to the certain authoritarian countries and whatnot. But now, as you all know, there's a mm -hmm. discussion going on in the U.S. about outbound investment screening, and the logic here is that the U.S. money should probably not be used to advance these emerging technologies and critical technologies in other countries. And the logical extension of this is that once the U.S. decides to engage in outbound investment screening, they would, of course, uh, diplomatically try to persuade us, the other countries, to say, you know, you guys should follow through. What's your opinion on that? Thanks. That's a good question. Um, can I come to you? Yeah. Uh, Good evening, my name is Kanesh Gaur. I'm the founder of India Future Foundation. Uh, I'm here uh, to ask a question to David. Uh, David, you spoke on interoperability, and you also mentioned about having good relations with neighbors to enable trade. Uh, but we see today uh, certain countries are following their foreign policy objectives through blackmailing, uh, enabling certain standards uh, to be followed, also focusing on uh, creating patents on specific technologies uh, right? Uh, like in case of 5G, we have seen maximum amount of patents being filed. So today the foreign policy objectives are met through controlling standards bodies, uh, through uh, doing information warfare, or promoting technology which have spyware. Now, with so much amount of, uh, you know, distrust which is happening, how do you build peace, how do you build stability, how do you ensure 
trade cooperation. Uh, and the final um, intervention. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Kazuto Suzuki. Um, I am a, a professor at the University of Tokyo and also uh, a director of the Institute of Geoeconomics. My question probably addressed to the Mr. Budres. Um, um, the, the geographic, uh, geopolitics of technology and the geopolitics of economy are all in intertwined. And I think if you try to separate and decouple the influence of Russia and China, I think it eventually creates the cost and how much cost that you can bear. That I, I think what is uh, happening in Lithuania is that it's uh, the the price of oils and uh, and the price of um, other uh, uh, commodities are increasing, and how much people can take all this uh, uh, cost that is eventually. Uh, um, arrived as a consequence of, of such a decoupling. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, let's start with Tanya and then come down to, um, uh, uh, to you, um, uh, to the NSA. But uh, Tanya, over to you. Uh, three questions, outbound investments. Uh, oh, look, uh, it's such a good question. Mm -hmm. And I'd say that it's not something that I've heard mm. significant national debate about. So I'm interested to hear from other countries. Um, no, no, no significant comment on that, except to say that um, many of the same principles that we and, use... And, and what about the question on coercive tech, use of either certain technologies uh, embedded with uh, certain vulnerabilities, uh, gaming of standards, and the chief defence scientist, are you paying more attention to this area? Absolutely. Um, we're there to make sure that Australia is fully informed when we make acquisition decisions, when we make decisions to develop technologies, we understand what the vulnerabilities are, and we understand what the interoperability challenges are too, if we ever need to operate with, uh, with our allies. So this is critical, and this is why we've been working to get deep connections with our industry base, um, because the speed of change there is just so great that we, you know, it's a very fluid space. But I'd also, it gives me the chance to say that um, it's not just about tackling the issues that we see now, but getting ahead sense. of the ones mm -hmm. that are coming. Mm -hmm. Being able to do technology foresighting and yep. horizon scanning. Yep. And in a way, I think otherwise the risk we have is that we over-focus on the things right in right. front of our face and don't see the bigger challenges that are not far off. So maybe the organisation itself will have to change. The, your team in the future would look very different. You'll have Correct. A, 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 a very agile, nimble, um, perhaps even a loose uh, arrangement to bring in the best minds to think about something. We've already moved that way in Australia in terms of seeing the base that we have as being our nation. Okay. Uh, the, the Americans see 7 billion global human population as being their innovation pool. Uh, that's one way to think about it. Um, uh, David. Yeah, I thought the point about uh, outbound investment screening is a fascinating one. I've never thought about it, uh, but I guess it's an obvious corollary to if you are screening inbound, then you have to consider this. So uh, similar comments to what Tanya says, I have to think about this. Uh, no conversations that I'm aware uh, on this uh, in my country. On the interop interoperability by our Indian colleague, I agree completely. I aspire for interoperability, but I'm clear-eyed. Uh, it's not something which uh, will happen by itself. It's not something that some countries are working towards. They are perhaps uh, deliberately trying to subvert some of the standard-making bodies, etc. So we have to be very clear. We have to be prepared. If we believe in this, then we have to build the capability. Build the capability that so our experts are there at these uh, standard-making bodies. Uh, we are appropriately represented. We can call them out if they're trying to subvert the system. We can call them out if they're trying to set standards which are not objectively um, proper. Uh, we also have to build capability for our own countries. When you set the standards and people are trying to sell you things, then you need to be able to vet the standards, mm -hmm. uh, ensure that they meet the appropriate standards for security, for resilience and performance. Um, it's, it's equivalent to being um, a capable buyer if you, if you want to buy a car. 
then the salesman tells you that it can do X, Y, or Z, then you have to have the ability to verify the, the claims and meet the, the safety and the security standards which you think are necessary. So talking about interoperability is not sufficient. You have a national responsibility to build a technical capability so that you can safeguard your interests. And of course, I must here make a mention of Singapore's uh, sandboxes approach, where you actually yes. uh, test technology before it yes. is let into the commercial space. And I think that's, again, something that we all must think about. Um, Kastutis, final intervention from you this afternoon. Yeah, and, and, and ultimately also on, uh, on investments, because uh, we also screening internal investments. And that was the most controversial thing when we introduced, meaning that in Lithuania, Lithuanian companies, when they invest, even acting in some of the strategic sectors that we have five, one of this is also technologies, and we have a big fintech sector, and then also the defense industry. So when they invest additionally, we screen it. And when we screen our own companies, our own Lithuanian companies, that is, you know, understand the, the, all the sensitivity of the situation, we also review all the investments abroad. In, if, for example, we had a big case when we had the strong Lithuanian company working in the uh, innovative transport sector, but that also invested in Russia and actually in China, they were prohibited to further invest in Lithuania. It means that you have to choose them where you are developing your business. So it's not like directly, you know, each outgoing uh, investment screening. That would be, you know, I'm just trying to operationalize all the process. That would be really difficult to do. But uh, when you're having a company coming to you with the papers, so that's a bit uh, different. So we have this. And of course, you know, it's, there is the political element in it. And uh, answering the question on the price uh, that, is, that uh, of course, the citizens and, and, uh, have to pay. And, uh, of course, the security costs. And then for us, and especially when the uh, war in Ukraine started, uh, this, this can you, even without, you know, this extra pathetic e emotion into it, but what, uh, you know, we can answer, we can ask uh, our citizens, and, and we do this politically, ask uh, how much our independence costs, and, and uh, how much your country mm -hmm. costs, and, and your, your freedom. Mm -hmm. That is where you are, when you can feel on your skin that this military threat is not theoretical, it's just next to your door having, having you know, two rogue states uh, next, next to you. So, uh, and, uh, and from previous, uh, uh, remembering that just previous our decisions and, and uh, big projects that we had, for example, LNG terminal, that we were the first mm -hmm. that bought and it was hugely expensive and actually with South Korea, we had this nice project almost 10 years ago. That, the, the reason was that at the time we were paying the biggest price in Europe for natural gas being next to the natural gas resource for the political reason, mm -hmm. up to three, four times the price that it was elsewhere in Europe, because that was the constant manipulation. And the political decision was, we have to stop this. Mm -hmm. And the only way to stop this is to, to have just alternative. And that okay. alternative was LNG terminal. The solution that now is on top of the need of all the nations that have the coast in Europe, because LNG is, is booming. And, and that, was, that was the solution with the price. And of course, you have to reach out and explain. And politically, it's difficult, and that's why it is so rarely implemented. Because if you have at least, you know, small option not to do it, and politicians would tend not to do it, you know. So, okay, let's go for some, something else, and, and there will be another, another coalition somewhere, you know, and then they will do it. Because, yes, there, there is a price. And there is the job for everyone to explain why we're paying it. So I think um, this is a good note to end this panel on. Um, Australia going back to the gym. Uh, Singapore, the pragmatist in the global order. And Lithuania, the country with the big heart. Uh, please join me in applauding each one of them for their wonderful interventions. And I won't try to sum up, but let's just keep talking about politics and technology and national security. I think this conversation is important. And Sydney Dialogue is the appropriate place to have these conversations. Thank you for inviting all of us. And we wish you a very pleasant evening and a great day tomorrow. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.